uplifting him like only you can, God. It is in your son Jesus' name that I pray. Thank you, Lord, and amen. Numbers 14, 1 through 6. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephaniah, which were them that searched the land, rent their clothes. The title of this morning's Sunday school lesson is Rebellion of the People. Numbers 14 and 1 says, And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. We live in a society, unfortunately, where many people are bound to seeking multiple sources to make important decisions over their lives, only to get very conflicting viewpoints because there are not very many people that can look into your situation, that can see all the hell that can be going around you, that can see all the issues that may be flowing out of you, that can see all the pains of life weighing down and aching you and all the stress of life that's beginning to start to depress you, that may be starting to shift weight off of you and drop off of you and still give you that sound Proverbs 3 and 5 advice to trust in the Lord with all your thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. See, most people operate off of their emotions and not off the facts of God's word. The Bible says in Mark 9 and 29, and he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. This is what made Sister Adam's teaching on Wednesday night about fasting and praying so powerful and so impactful because prayer and fasting are the only two things with the power to keep your mind stayed upon thee no matter what may be going on around you. It's only prayer and fasting are the only two things that can keep your mind from going to the left when everything in your eyesight knows that there is nothing that is going right. It's only prayer and fasting that are the only two things that can subject your f flesh long enough to be able to think straight to know that the sun has got to shine if I just continue to hold out. It's only when your flat flesh is in true subjection that you don't provoke your inner wrath of Satan every time that somebody has mistakenly done something wrong. It's only when you put your flesh in true subjection that you know that, though we, that you may feel the weeping enduring for the night. You still know that in your spirit that the joy is coming in the morning. It's only when your flesh is in true subjection that you can understand it's in your distress, not in your complaints, that when you cry to the Lord, he will hear you. Because when you are operating in the flesh, you are only operating in your emotions. But when you're operating in the spirit, you are able to activate the operation of the word of God. This is why the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 through 18, pray without ceasing and everything give thanks for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus concerning you. You have got to pray without ceasing to strengthen your faith. Because Satan is busy attacking without ceasing to strengthen your fears. 1 John 2 and 16 says, For all that is in this world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Satan's primary goal is to fixate ourselves on the desires of our own heart so that we may become obsessed with everything revolving around our own selves in order to get our minds to only think about how life only affects us and how it only affects ourselves. This is why Satan specifically prays on the mind because he is an emotional abuser of the mind. 
Satan uses emotional abuse in the mind to control the way that we think, to overly criticize us and to embarrass us and to make us feel shamed and to continue to blame us and humiliate us and perpetrate insults over our lives and manipulate us into a way of thinking that generally instills fear inside of us. Because as long as we hear the voice of fear, we will never be able to stand up to hear the voice of faith. Numbers 14 and 1 says, All the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. It goes without saying that bad news spreads quickly. Bad news travels quicker than anybody will share blessed news. People are quick to report what you did wrong far quicker than they will salute you for what you did right. Because when Satan is controlling your mind, it will have you thinking everything backwards. Negative reports are based on unbelief and fear. When the bad report of the ten faithless spies made its way back through the entire camp, all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. The bad news had their imaginations running rapid, and they could no longer see through the visions that God had given them. The only thing that they could do was operate in the fears that Satan kept trying to imp put in them. This is why Satan tries to play with our minds because when he cannot take us out he tries to mentally wear you out because it's when you get mentally worn out that you then begin to do things with the doubt that comes in your spirit. Pastor kind of taught us when you are just walking around with just enough mentally you will snap at any moment and when you begin to get in a state where you will snap, you get in a state where you become in disorder. And when you get in a state that you're in disorder, you fall into a state filled with fear, disappointment, and rage. And when you fall into a state of fear, disappointment, and rage, you fall into a state where the only thing that you know how to do is rebel. And when you fall into a state when you begin to rebel, you fall into a state of amnesia when ultimately you become like the Israelites, that your rage becomes the voice that wants to be heard louder than your humility of the patience to resist everything that the enemy is trying to throw at you. Rage will cause you to forget everything that God brought you through. Rage will make you forget and cloud your memory from remembering every good deed that God has manifested within our lives. The Israelites cried out so loud in rage that they forgot all the plagues on Egypt. They had forgotten the, how God had parted the Red Sea for them. They had forgotten how the water came from the rock and their victory over the Amalekites. They had forgotten the protection and guiding pillar of the cloud and the fire that God was leading them by day and night and how the bitter waters of Morab, the, how God made them sweet. Instead, the Israelites gave into the difficult tendency what we all have surrendered to in testing times and became self-consumed where they began to magnify their problems over God's redeeming grace. Verse 2 through 6. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God had had or would God we had died in the wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be prey? Were it not better for us? to return into Egypt. And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun and, the, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were them that searched the land, rent their clothes. Once again, the chronic illness of complaining had manifested back within the Israelites. After they wept and cried over the report of the 10 spies, they began to murmur against Moses and Aaron. The camp saw Aaron and Moses as the ones that led them into the impossible situation that they felt that they were now in and complained against them. See, it's a thing to think that everybody else is the problem rather than looking at how the problem developed within you. 
See, it's a thing to think that everybody is the problem, but the person complaining is not the problem. We live in a society where people do not like to share the responsibility. They only like to cast fault on who the responsibility belongs to. If we, are, if we only have a tendency to blame others, we never can truly solve problems because the only thing that we're doing is trying to nitpick who the problem is, not how to try to solve the problem. Complaining that things in our life are so wrong because our conscious, we don't have a conscious enough to understand that if we keep thinking about the solu if we keep thinking that the solution is to replace the problem, we never stop to see that no matter how many times we can replace a problem, and no matter how many times you actually execute the replacement, if the problem is still there, it's not within the replacements that you're replacing. The problem is within the replacer because if God never shifted to move what the problem was, but you kept replacing what you think the problem was, God is then ultimately telling you to stop shifting blame on everybody else and start looking in the mirror at how the blame is suddenly you. The Israelites' problem was they trusted Aaron and Moses when they had nothing, but they lacked loyalty when they got everything. 1 Corinthians 4 and 2 says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Loyalty is valuable. And the Israelites were the perfect example that they were loyal to their needs being met, but they were not loyal to the needs of God. See, the Israelites began to murmur and complain against Moses and Aaron when life wasn't going the way that they felt like life should be going because like many of us today it's easy to pinpoint everything wrong with the person but then somehow the pen doesn't have ink anymore when it's time for us to start pinpointing out the problems that lie within us. We can create a whole list of everything that is wrong with somebody else but then all of a sudden we don't have a pen or paper and a pad when it's time for us to start dissecting the problems that lie within ourselves. It's hard for us to be strong in adversity and not fall, the, fall by the wayside during the test of adversity. Many people instantly think that it's a curse over your life for you to be going through things, but really it's a sign that God is still with you because the Bible tells us in Psalms 34 and 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them at him out of them all. Like the Israelites, many of us complain about the afflictions because many of us don't understand the reason why we are afflicted. See, you only get afflicted when you're in the right position to be afflicted. You only get afflicted when God sees you as being a righteous person to hand you over to be afflicted. So it's not that you have a curse in being afflicted. You really have a blessing from God that he chose you to endure in some of the affliction that you're going through. Because when you're in the right position to be hand selected, it's a privilege that comes from God to be afflicted. The Bible says in Job 1 and 8, And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? See, when you're walking around through the voice of faith, and walking with the belief of God, then you can understand that it's a privilege to be hand, handed over to Satan by God. When you understand that you that God has never lost a match, then you understand when he hands you over, he's also got to be the one to defend every battle that he handed you over to be able to fight. It's a privilege to be thrown in the wilderness when you understand that God had never let you run dry when you are in the wilderness. See, sometimes what the Israelites didn't understand is like many of us, we complain about storms because somehow we begin to walk around with such little faith that we think we're going to melt if we get wet. We think that somehow we're going to sink if we have to put our foot into the water, if we have to step out and get touched by a puddle. Somehow we forget everything that God has brought us through and has taught us to overcome. We fail to realize that the Bible says in Galatians 6 and 9, 
and let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. See, sometimes the realness of the test is designed to see who is going to fold under the pressure. Sometimes God has to tear down your entire house just to see who really is loyal enough to get a hammer to start building it back up. It's God sometimes has to tear that let the little foxes come into your yard, not because he's really trying to tear down your yard, but he's really trying to see who's loyal enough to re-fertilize everything in the yard when the, everything starts to die. See, sometimes God has to allow the hurry came to be able to come into your life just to see which one of us are loyal enough not to really be blown away in the storm. Sometimes God just wants to know, are you really loyal to him? Are, are you just loyal to the needs of your circumstances that you know if you pray out will come through him? Numbers 14, 2 through 4 says, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and, and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto the land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt. It's a sad thing to speak the Lord's name in vain, but it's even sadder when you tell God he is incompetent of how he delivered you. See, the worst thing you can do is disrespect the character of God's name by lying and using his name in vain to justify in the situations of our own mess. The A part of Numbers 23 and 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. See, if God ain't repenting for his own self, how dare we think that we can lie on him and think that he's then going to stand up and repent on our behalf when he didn't even do it for his own self. How dare we ever get the audacity to become like the Israelites and suddenly start to think that God was smart enough to answer our prayers, but then turn around and say that he was incompetent when he delivered us with the answer. It's a disgrace to God to drop down to your knees and pray and then complain to God every day that he somehow messed up on how he delivered you the blessing. See, I don't ever want to get so caught up in my own self and my own selfless way of thinking that I start to begin to think like the Israelites and begin to tell God that the pits of hell that he, that he rescued me from are better than the liberty that he somehow, that he suddenly has me walking around in. See, I don't ever want to make God think that I'm anything like the Israelites, that when I was getting knocked upside my head, when I was in an abusive marriage, something that I think that anything that's going on in my life today has suddenly overcome what that feeling is. See, I don't ever want to get so caught up that I think that my, that my own broken heart and my own sleepless nights and my own reckless moments and my own nights of despair my own times of misery can even compare to the victories that God has won over in my life. See, my mother oftentimes would teach me about gratitude when I was growing up by telling me a story about the worst whooping that she ever got for being ungrateful. She said that many of nights her mother wouldn't even get anything to eat because she would sacrifice her meal just for her so that my mother could eat. And one day my mother told her mother that she didn't want to eat the chicken, that the only part that she wanted was the, that she wanted the skin. And when her mother began to rebuke her for being ungrateful for the sacrifice that she made, my mother said that she told her mother that she wished that she was dead. See, God sacrificed his only begotten son 
42 generations ago so that we can live abundantly so we don't get caught up in our own way of thinking that we convince ourselves that we would rather be dead than think about the sacrifice that he put over our lives every single day when he left his son to die for us thinking that the things that he delivered us from somehow were the better than the life that he has brought us to so I don't ever want to be caught up thinking like the Israelites to rebel against God so that he makes me die in my wilderness because I continue to complain about going back to the wilderness. I don't ever want to get so caught up in my thinking that I convince God to make me die in the sins that I was in because I'm still complaining how he brought me out of the past sins that I was in. I don't ever want to get so caught up in my thinking and become like the Israelite and think that anything that God has done can overcome the blessings that he has over my life. <laughs> Come on, 